back to another Friday edition of Green Rush Live, really live from our world headquarters outside of Boston, Massachusetts in Clinton, Massachusetts. And I had some visitors earlier today uh, that will be on our 530 show that have a great story to tell. And we actually took a picture and I did send it to our director, Dan, but I have never found out if he actually got it and might be able to push, put it up there at some point, not now, but when more comes on, um, we'll have that. We are waiting for Chris Walsh from MJ BizCon to join us. There was a little communication snafu with the link, but we are efforting getting him the link as we speak. And we will be able to welcome in and talk a little bit about the uh, MJ Biz Daily Group and also MJ BizCon, the biggest trade show for cannabis in the world. I'm Jimmy Young from Pro Cannabis Media, joined alongside by Rick Thompson this, this particular week from Michigan. And there is our pal and friend, and he's ready to go. Hi, Chris. Hey there, sorry, I didn't, I didn't have a link to get in here, so I was scrambling. I sent you a link when I first booked you, but that's okay. It's all right, it's all right. It, was, it wasn't in the invite. I blame that's you. A, <laughs> I'm sure I have you learned. Did. I have learned that there are people that you have to make sure that you send them the right calendar invite with the Zoom link inside it because that's how people find stuff, right? That Is that me. accurate? <laughs> yes. All right. Well, Chris, I, I don't. Have you ever met Rick Thompson from Michigan? He's been to your show a few times. Rick, have we met in person? I'm not sure. Uh, not in person, no. But I think okay. we've been broadcast before, Chris. And it's nice yeah. to see you again. Nice to see you as well. All right, so you're up against it, Chris Walsh. You've got what less than ten days, maybe or 50, 13 days to go. Where? Tell me, is the countdown beginning? How anxious are you? What does the turnout look like? Give us a up to date uh, update on uh, MJ BizCon coming up in just a few weeks. Yeah. Um, before I start, I want to preface it with my daughter is home. I don't have a sitter today, so she's listening to some story in the background here. It's fairly loud, so if you hear like a fairy tale in the background. That's not my normal kind of background working music. Uh, my daughter's right. back there. Um, no, we're, we're excited for the show. I mean, it's, uh, you know, this is a big production. We work on it year round. Uh, already have to start working on next year's pretty soon here too. Um, but, you know, the industry is uh, going through some growing pains right now, as we discussed last time. Um, so we're, you know, we're expecting a big surge as we get closer. Uh, we should have, you know, over 30,000 uh, attendees, could be 35. You just don't know in this industry People uh, like to plan last minute and, you know, with the elections coming up, uh, you know, we're hoping that we'll get a sweep there or, or close to a sweep uh, for the industry with legalization. And that always spurs a lot of interest in the conference as well, right after the election. So we're gearing up. We're ready to roll. We're going to have, uh, you know, I think uh, over 1,300 exhibitors and, um, and a lot of new things as well. And, uh, you know, the hype has begun. The countdown is on. And you know, every time I go on LinkedIn, someone's talking about talking about speaking at it or going to it or exhibiting at it. So glad we could help create that ecosystem for the industry. I, I would I would guess that I get between six and twelve requests for interviews uh, on a daily basis uh, that are people that are going to MJ Biz. So it is still the event in the industry to be at. Chris, you guys have done an amazing job, and I know the beautiful thing about when you have success is you guys try to keep it going, try to maintain success, try to reinvent yourself almost every year. And you made some changes at your last one. And I believe you're also doing the same thing here. So you're kind of categorizing different parts of the convention center. Is that what's going on? Yeah, we call it segmentation. And, you know, over the years, a, a big complaint has been as the, as the event has grown, you know, you got 30,000 people walk, walking around a giant show floor and it's hard to kind of find what you need. Uh, and it's harder for the exhibitors to stand out. So uh, we were able to segment the show floor into broad categories, business services, cultivation, you know, retail, um, some um, extraction processing so that people can go to an area, a designated area of the show floor, and all the companies involved in that space will be there. So we hope that's going to help people navigate uh, this massive event. And, you know, we're also trying to to spur a little bit more fun. So it's it's business event, but, you know, we've got some lounges, we've got an outdoor patio with food trucks and uh, DJs and some games. and you know, trying to to evolve uh, or what we offer the industry as well. So it's not just uh, strictly, not just strictly buttoned up business. No, in fact, I've got the list of uh, parties right here in front of me. And I, I, I'm going to nine pages long, 22, 23, yeah. <laughs> something like that. And and I think that's interesting that, that you should take pride in the fact that not only are you driving people to your convention, but think about 
what the impact you have on the economy in Las Vegas, you're not just a, a one-stop pony anymore, right? You impact a day's worth, a week's worth of activities around that convention that are probably as important as far as schmoozing goes as the actual convention itself. Yeah. And I, I think when I mentioned ecosystem earlier, I'm I'm happy that we could help create that for the industry because when we started, it didn't have anything like this. There's no professional gatherings at all, you know, 11 years ago uh, like this. So, you know, we've grown along with the industry and we credit the industry for much of our ability to do this, of course. But I love the spinoffs and the fact that people come and you can get your business primarily done during the day. And then there's always, you know, a list of after parties. You're figuring out where to go. Uh, companies invest a lot of money in them. There's some really cool ones. And like you said, a lot of times you can get a lot of business done at those too. You know, right. sharing a drink or a joint, uh, wherever it is, uh, or just talking, talking, meeting people. And so we're, I'm, I'm happy. You know, it's, it's funny. I'll go there and I'll take a cab. Uh, and mention what I do if they ask. I, not when I'm there for MJ BizCon, when I'm there to speak at another event or visiting. And sometimes the cab drivers are like, oh yeah, I know that show, like that week, you know, it, it, because it kind of spreads across the strip and 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 we're known, the cannabis industry is known, that's its week in Vegas, right? And it takes over the city. So that's kind of cool as an industry that, that, we're that, that we're that big and we're that legit. And then you're in a spot that is welcoming the industry and is trying, actually, there's quite a few companies that are now based in Las Vegas. They're opening up, uh, they've already approved social clubs, even though they won't be open and ready and legal uh, for the, this particular show. But uh, it's, a, it's a nice place to be when you're doing this kind of thing. It's a fun, it's an adult playground, Chris. Of course it's fun. Of course the weed industry's event is there. Um, no, you yeah. know, when we first moved to to vegas and decided to anchor our event there there was some pushback and people said it was just medical then right and it wasn't a very good program i don't even think it was very regulated uh it was just kind of messy uh but we just kind of tried to play the long game and felt like as a convention destination vegas is good some people hate vegas right um but a lot of people like it i think it fits with the spirit of this industry and 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 it's proved to be a great strategic move for us because you know consumption lounges right you just mentioned um, those haven't really been a thing anywhere in the country. They haven't been done well or done right. Vegas and Nevada are kind of leading the way. So we hope as those open to really have strong partnerships with them at the next MJ BizCon, right? So, you know, you, you go to MJ BizCon and you, you can't smoke, right? The convention center doesn't allow it. You can't have flour. You know, people are doing stuff. We all know that. But, you know, to be able to collaborate with the consumption lounges to bring that element as part of the show off the show floor where it's allowed and legal I think it's gonna it's gonna be really cool down the road. There you go, Rick. I know you've got you're chomping at the bit. I'm gonna let you take a couple of questions for Chris. I'm sorry. Well, no, that's great. Uh, first of all, I think you're right when you you talk about rewarding your attendees by the fact that there's a consumption lounge close enough that they can still convention and and 420 at the same time. That's been the dream everyone's had, and and even every casino in the United States of America would love to be able to do that. But as federal property, you can't allow any of that on there. Uh, mm -hmm. But you did mention something that I thought sort of flew under the radar, but I think it's more, it's worthy of a little conversation. You're going to cluster similar companies together in different regions of the convention. Now, typically, we like to put other people between competitors so that they're not <laughs> right next to each other. How has the reception been amongst your vendors to this new development? I think that's a great question because the reason we hadn't done it in the past, I mean, I remember talking about this in 17 or 18 internally and saying hey this is getting unwieldy the exhibitors pushed back pretty hard for the reasons you just said they said i don't want to be next to my competitor uh, or i don't want to be lumped in one area i do five things and i have to pick one and, and then i won't be seen over here but but the reality of the situation is and this is common in every other industry for large trade shows what we're doing it's very common you go to ces you know they they have it down to a science for the you know the consumer electronics show um the reception has been kind of a slow warm-up and we'll see how it goes. Some are really eager for it, but the whole thing is, if the attendees can't find you, <laughs> you know, why, why, how, what good is it to be there? So if if you're next to a competitor, good, game on. Like you're going to be having your A1 sales pitch and you're going to be in, in, in another area. But if you're looking at it from the attendee perspective, who you're ultimately trying to get as an exhibitor, this this is huge. If you're looking for, you know, cultivation equipment and it's spread out over this massive show floor it's just kind of a hodgepodge of what you come across maybe you see something in the exhibitor list and you could miss people that way but if you're going over there and there's you know all all the greenhouse companies uh again it's it's kind of 
that's just the reality of it. But for attendees, and that's who we're focused on with this, which ultimately benefits the exhibitors, I think it's a really good thing. Yeah, I love the phrase slow warm up. That was wonderful. You know, <laughs> it, it, I attended a, a conference uh, earlier on in the in the teens here in Michigan, and green Buddha seeds had just ridiculously huge display uh it looked, took like four spaces it was monstrous and it seems like with mj bizcon the size of your after party sometimes determines a corporate identity would you agree that some of the biggest companies are throwing some of the biggest parties well as what we've seen in evolution in the industry and, and this is widespread but we see it on our level but it's a part of a bigger picture is that the um, recognition of, of the value of branding and de developing your brand and the sophistication now involved in that, you know, it used to be um, companies when I when I put it in the trade show perspective, just getting a booth was a booth and they didn't really know what to do with it or, you know, and and now as, as it's gotten more competitive, the industry as it's grown, people are investing a lot more time and money into doing cool things with their boat booth. One, one had a hot tub there once, you know, or they have like a, you know, a, an ice luge or something, you know, they're they're trying to stand out, right? And so the after parties and sponsorships of things like that outdoor patio area with the DJs and stuff, you're building that brand and you're building that name recognition. And that wasn't really what companies did very well or put a lot of money into six, seven years ago. So as the industry's evolved, we've just seen the demand from exhibitors change as well. And these after parties, to your point, are a great way, especially if kind of you're more of a consumer facing company and not as heavy on the B2B side, Right. You know, you can you can get all these people in and, and they're going to remember the blank party, you know, because it was it was awesome. And so they'll remember they'll remember your company. I was going to say they remembered the party, though. So does that make oh, it a good party? Maybe, I mean, maybe they, <laughs> yeah, right. well, that's the danger, right? You host the best party in town and people might not just remember who hosted it. Look, you know, when I get it. We remember when people booze, they forget. So, yeah. We well, I got to tell you, unless I write people's names down and follow up on, a, you know, now you walk around with your phone and your business cards, and now at least you can take notes on, okay, now who did I just talk to? Yeah. Because you meet so many people in such a short period of time. And I don't know about you, I'm a male, guys. And, you know, selective listening is part of our gender, okay? Right? I mean, it just is. I don't know about you, but I get crap for that. All right. I definitely do. I don't know if you, you guys are all smiling. So you know what I'm talking about here. That yeah. being said, when you're on a business event, you don't want to forget who you just talked to. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, it's always a challenge, but I, I do want to mm -hmm. go back to the state of the industry for a second, Chris, because that's always your, your thing the first day when you, you welcome everybody and, and you give a state of the industry address and collaboration versus competition. Here in Massachusetts, everybody knows what's been going on. You watch it. It's four years into its adult use program now, 240, 50 odd dispensaries, um, plenty of medical programs, plenty of trade shows, uh, lots of space, lots of grow. Uh, it's becoming more competitive. This is an open market after all. This is an agricultural product after all. Where do, Are you starting to see the ugliness of competition, or are you starting to see the favorable collaboration in the industry? I see a bit of it all, right? And I think um, uh, without giving it away, part of what I'm gonna talk about in the state of the industry is right now, you know, uh, we have a tale of two industries uh, uh, or three industries or four, and it, it depends on a lot of factors. So right. you hear all this pain going on, but that depends on geography. It depends on your business structure. It depends on a lot of things. And there's other areas or other companies that are doing just fine. And they're not feeling the pain that everyone talks about at the conferences. And they all, you know, all the people in California are so down on the industry and now in Michigan and in Colorado. And, but if you're in a new market, you're like, this is awesome, you know, and that's your focus. Or if you're a small local place and you've got a, you know, you got a very limited license state and you've got the, one of those licenses, you're, you're doing just fine right now. Um, so to your point, I think um, it just depends where you are and, and competition is good as we all know, I keep showing your toes. In some states, there ha there's going to have to be a culling. They're just going to have, and, and these ones with wide open licenses where it's very easy to get in, um, you know, they're, that's what survival of the fittest is and it's gonna be painful. And it's going to be difficult. Um, and so your your trade-off in like a Michigan is if they had just come out with, hey, we're only going to give 50 licenses. And then everyone complained you can't get in. But 
those 50 companies would probably be doing really, really well, like Florida, right? Where only a, basically a handful, you know, two dozen companies have licenses. And, you know, so truly has, you know, most of them domination of the market, right? And they're doing fine there. So, um, you know, if you're in a market, the ship is sailed, the regulations are out there. Yeah, you're going to have to compete. And there are ugly sides to that. But honestly, what industry isn't like that? Especially in a open market society and capitalism exactly. and all that. That's the idea. You're letting the market dictate the, the size of it. But there's always going to be challenges and growth. And if anybody has ever started a company, I don't care in what industry, there's a ton of challenges with startups. All right. Yeah. Um, interesting news item that broke today. And, you know, we like to do a new show that follows uh, this live show every week on Friday on at six o'clock. And this broke today, so it's not part of our news, so I've incorporated it into our live discussion here. And it has to do with um, the acquisition uh, by Sean Diddy Combs of a $185 million deal for Cresco Labs and Columbia Care for 12 locations in Massachusetts, New York, and Illinois. This is a great sign, I think, when you have a African-American uh, business person putting money into the industry to help the industry because he hears these horror stories of others that are in the social economic and empowerment programs trying to get out from under, trying to get into it, and they just can't. And now at least there's going to be some more friendly um, investment money or retail money, uh, jobs available because of the leadership of Mr. Mr. Diddy himself. Uh, did you know you knew Diddy. about this? I'm sure. Oh yeah, oh yeah. I agree. I mean, I I, I think this is significant, and and there's a couple reasons why. And you touched on them. Is that when we've seen a lot of celebrities get involved, they're the face of the company. You know, they're the one they trot out at the at the trade show or on their packaging, and a lot of times they're not really tied to the business. Um, uh, you know, and they're not like, you know, even Jim Belushi is out there chasing gophers off his outdoor grow. Like he got hands on right with, with cultivating, but a lot of them aren't that way. Right. And, um, and what I like about this is, is you have a celebrity making a massive investment to own a fairly substantial company now that he's creating with these assets and own them and run them. And that not only that, <clears throat> he's saying, I'm doing this for another purpose, right? Another reason. It's a good investment in his idea, and he's getting into a new industry, and he's a business-minded guy now, uh, but he's doing it for the reasons you mentioned, to help others get involved in the industry who haven't been able to get involved. And I think that level of influence uh, in the industry and in this size of a company that he's creating is significant. So it's moves like this that show you, hey, there are ways to increase diversity in the industry, and, uh, and people stepping up that already have the money, that have already been successful, and taking the reins, you know, uh, of businesses in this industry is one way to do it because he's going to come in and that's going to be his focus is not only running a successful business, but doing it with, you know, uh, giving people opportunities. And so I love it. I mean, I, I really love it. And it's it's not just him saying, oh, you know, Diddy's got a new line of coming out with his face on it, you know, like who cares about that? This is This could actually make a difference. And also the last element of this is just continue to see the mainstream come in, right? And uh, and and Diddy, you know, like he, we used to, I remember the days when the only celebrities were involved were the Cheeches and Chongs or a lot of the, like the celebrities that were popular 30 years ago that fell off the face of the radar. You're like, oh, they're still alive. And then they're like with a cannabis brand or something, right? And then you started getting some more current celebrities, right? And now you got, you got like big, big people coming right. in and this can only help further this to make it more legitimate. Chris, and I, and equitable I, and, and with an opportunity for those who have been most impacted on the war on drugs. You know, everybody likes to point the finger at the big MSOs, Chris, that this is, you know, they're the evil ones. They're the ones that are on it just for the money and all this. How important is a group of multi-state operators for a young industry like cannabis? How, how important is a group of them? Yeah, having actually successful MSOs in business uh, kind of fueling fueling the lobbyists, fueling the industry, fueling th the growth of it because yeah. they have the money. That's a snake's den uh, because, or a nest. I don't think snakes live in a den. Um, <laughs> long day, long week. Um, but no, to your point, uh, yeah, there. every industry has the powerhouses that, that can help change laws and sway laws. 
And so this industry needs that kind of money and focus, which has always been more of a grassroots type of thing, you know, with the MPPs of the world, um, uh, you know, really taking that on, activist type mentality and not necessarily the businesses driving that discussion. So on one hand, that is really good and it's going to be needed. On the other hand, if it's only the MSOs and they're dominating the discussion, they're, they're going to have market structures that benefit them. And they're going to influence the laws in ways that benefit them. And it might not benefit the small business owner. It might not benefit the mom and pops. They don't want, you know, too many licenses because they think they'll get them and then control the market, more or less. And some of, some of the CEOs of MSOs are saying, no, we're all about this and this. Remains to be seen if they really are. They're going to influence the laws, right? And so we might see change that they help introduce, but it might not be good change for everybody and, and likely won't be for everybody. So you've got the MSOs and then you've got your craft growers. And I'm pretty sure I read something about how the craft grower and the craft brewer in beer could be uh, very similar as far as development goes. Uh, how do you view that? And do you, everyone that I know, and this is what I've heard, uh, the multi-state operator weed is here and the craft growers weed is here because it's easier to grow smaller, better plants. I think that's what I've been learning. Am I wrong here? Well, I mean, it's like anything, you know, if you're a small batch brewer and you're, you, you can innovate quicker, you can um, experiment, you can uh, really put your time into your top really high quality beers, right? The same thing is true here. So I agree with that analogy. And I've been, uh, I've been on that train for years saying that hopefully the industry evolves where you're going to have the mass mass produced cannabis by the big companies that are in every state and everyone knows them. Uh, but that there's going to still be rooms, substantial room for the craft locally grown, maybe sun grown, like whatever it is that you're doing very uniquely um, across the country. And I do think that, that that's how it will evolve. I don't see any reason that it wouldn't unless all those smaller ones go out of business because they can't compete. But if they're really producing high quality in demand flour and strains, they're going to find a place. You know, one thing I'll say is that it's difficult for a brand to develop a national identity because each individual state requires cultivation inside that state itself. So you may have, a, let's say, a Jeter that's produced in California that's really done by great guys and a Jeter produced in Michigan done by some moderate guys and it's not nearly the same experience. So yeah. when you're talking about establishing a national brand, that's a real restriction because there's it's not like the McDonald'sization of cannabis as we were worried about because your, your double cheeseburger tastes exactly the same no matter what state you're in. Uh, yeah. The one thing I'll say also, you've got to, uh, as far as the Diddy story goes, oftentimes we've seen African-Americans do collaborations with existing companies. We've also seen Al Harrington and, and uh, uh, Megatron form their own companies and jump off in that direction. But for Diddy to buy his way into the market at the $185 million level, that's what I think really sets this particular acquisition apart from any other experiment or any other successful venture that's been launched by an African-American. Chris, can you recall anything else of this magnitude that would have this kind of social ramification? No, you bring up a great point. That is that is how it's unique. Um, and the sheer size and scale of it too. Um, not only the, the acquiring into the industry versus kind of starting from the ground up. Uh, no, I haven't seen that. Um, you know, I, I know Jay-Z was, you know, uh, starting a big investment fund, but it's, it's you know, I don't know how, we've heard that kind of thing before, and sometimes you never hear about it again. Um, you know, that was kind of a, a unique way in to, to fund the companies, right, that are, that are going to need money and that are going to hopefully be the leaders in the future. Uh, but no, I haven't seen anything like this. And it'll be an experiment. Like, is he going to be able to run these effectively and his team? Like, obviously, he needs a team, uh, you know, I don't know how, how hands-on he's going to be in this. Um, is he going to be, you know, in there every day? Probably not. Is he really the high level kind of keep the strategy and focus and just hiring an uh, operations and exec team around him? Um, so we'll see, you know, I mean, just because he bought it doesn't mean he'll be successful too. And so we, we all need to, hopefully he can figure this out because it would be a real shame if he buys it and he's not successful. Well, right. the one thing is that because of his declarations right at the onset of this purchase about social equity, he'll be under the microscope as far as the composition of his leadership team and yep. his and his stores as well, too. 
if his if his ideals at the onset don't actually match the hiring practices his company is able to successfully do this won't be a great experience for for p diddy but let's just let's just acknowledge that he really is a very successful businessman in many different venues uh so it's an it's a great addition to the industry as far as i'm concerned because here's someone with a pre-existing success pattern uh, Mm -hmm. who's really getting in in a big way absolutely totally agree with that I'd be uh, remiss if I didn't get one more comment about the president of the United States actually mentioned the word, well, he used marijuana, but he recognized that the laws were wrong, that the scheduling is screwed up. And while we can get into the whether or not he pardoned 6,500 names or people, because we don't know, I, I'm still waiting to talk to somebody who did get pardoned in that yeah, 6,500 right. list, okay? Yeah. Uh, that being said, we both we all live to hear the day that the leader of the free world gave respect in a lot of ways that this industry exists, it deserves some help in changes to the laws and the structure of what they've actually uh, been able to avoid and, and overcome and become a legitimate business. And while the economy is the biggest issue to many voters as they go to the polls on Tuesday, it seems to me if you've got an industry that has job growth, uh, revenue growth, tax growth, this will be helpful if it may even stave off a recession, Chris. What do you th- what did you think about the whole Biden and uh, cannabis mention that he mentioned uh, a few weeks ago? I thought it was fantastic. And, uh, you know, I put something on LinkedIn and someone was like, oh, you know, what is this is BS. He didn't go far enough. This is just lip service. And I'm like, I get it. If he did it for political reasons, I don't care. I don't care because we've never had a sitting president acknowledge that there needs to be change. A sitting president. And that's what he came out to say. It wasn't wrapped in some long conversation about something. He just like snuck it in somewhere. This was his message, his specific message he came out to announce. And, um, and so regardless of if it's 6,000, if it, if it mattered, like whatever, he's addressing it. He's putting in the, he's, he's laying the groundwork for future change, whether it comes from him or not. This is, um, this to me, it's, it's a historic part of the big history of the cannabis industry. This is one of those things on the timeline that, you know, stands out a little bit. It's like not, the it's memorandum. Not, exactly. Yeah. It's not a, it's yeah. Like the coal memo and all that. It's not panacea. Maybe nothing else specifically comes from this, right? Maybe. He says they're going to look into rescheduling, and then we never hear it about again, and then he's out of office. I have no idea, but the fact that we're having the conversation at the highest levels of government in this country, finally, someone's saying something about this and saying he's going to do something, I think is is huge. It's just like when one chamber in Congress passes a cannabis bill. Um, it's like, okay, yeah, the other one's not going to pass it, but hey, this is one of the, you know, it's steps. It's incremental steps. Right. And this fits in that big picture of these incremental steps without the ones before it. Biden would have said this. Right. He wouldn't have gotten here because of all the steps like this that happened before it. So this is one of those steps. It's a big one. We'll see what happens. But I'm I I love it. We've lived to see the day that a Supreme Court judge this recognizes that there's an inconsistency between the federal and the state laws and a sitting president. So this is all progress as far as I'm concerned. Chris Walsh. Best of luck down in Vegas. Uh, you, you know my heart and spirit will be there. Yeah, absolutely. Right. I wish you could attend this year, but thank you guys. I appreciate it, and I'll talk to you soon. You bet. Thank there you, goes Chris. Chris Walsh from MJ BizCon. He's got a lot of work to do. We're going to let him go. As a broker, we have access to many, many cannabis carriers, so I will go in with two or three uh, quotes for people. The quotes might be 20000 for one, 22,000 for another, 17,500 for another. Pretty close among the three. What I tell people is it's not the pricing, it's what's included and not included, meaning exclusions. An exclusion in layman's terms is just something that's not included. It's not on the menu, so it's just not included. But if you don't know that, if no one shows you that on page 71 of 150 page policy, you're not gonna know, no one knows. I never met one person that says they read an insurance policy. If you do, you know, I got some property in Florida for you.
Weed Talk and In the Weeds are two productions of pro-cannabis media supported by Revolutionary Clinics, one of the top medical cannabis dispensaries in the Massachusetts area. Now with three locations in Greater Boston, two in Cambridge and one on Broadway in Somerville. Rev Clinics has a patient-first mission. They will customize your needs as a medical patient with the proper titration and combination of strains, flavors, and products. Rev Clinics, where the patient comes first. So the the reality of the matter is, uh, you know, big banks and small banks are going to be different in a lot of ways. And they're both going to have their advantages and disadvantages. For a business like cannabis, you really have to have an integral knowledge of that business and a real granular knowledge of that business and the players involved in it. And that's why if you look at the banks that are successful to play in this space in Massachusetts, they are smaller banks that are very heavy, intensified, personal touch, human communication, where you don't get a lot of that with the bigger banks. Bay State Cannabis Report is supported by Holyoke Cannabis, Holyoke's finest cannabis recreational experience. Pro-Cannabis Media Programming is available live and on demand on our Facebook page at pro Media, on Instagram at pro Media, on LinkedIn also at pro Media, on YouTube and YouTube Live on pro Media, Twitter at pro Media, and on twitch.tv backslash pro Media. So like, share, and subscribe to all of our content, newsletters, and shows live or on demand. We are Pro Cannabis Media.